Postmodernism is most broadly described as the literary period after the Second World War. So from rough, roughly 1945 until now, this is postmodernism. But I want to say high postmodernism or proper postmodernism bears a certain aesthetic. Uh, beware of naming your literary period anything, anything like modern or postmodern, because I mean, modern ended. So we had to have postmodern. So now what do we say? We say contemporary. Well, are we going to say post-contemporary? I don't know. It's better to name it something else like romanticism. Unfortunately, you only have that with the benefit of hindsight. Postmodernism is after the Second World War. Let's talk about the Second World War. Let's do this. Second World War, oh man, I know this. I know it has been drilled into everyone's heads since we've been in the uh, primary grades. It was a rough war. Very rough war. In fact, I would say it was the roughest. But it didn't last as long as our current wars, not as long as Afghanistan, not as long as Iraq, the Iraqi war. It was more brief. However, it was more spectacularly awful. I want to say that we have, we do have uh, some we do have many photographs, many bits of evidence of the horror of the Second World War. I have here a, a quotation, writing poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric. What does that mean? Well, it means after you see some of the horrible brutality, some of the terrible, terrible, inhumane, evil things that were done during the Second War, and not only the evil things that were done, but the things that were, were necessarily had to be done to stop them in retaliation. There's How many movies, how many books have been made about the subject? So many. You see here the mushroom cloud, and just an iconic symbol. And indeed, the only time in, in human history when nuclear bombs have been brought to bear in war have been during the Second World War, and it was America who brought them. There was another thing that happened, equally horrific, perhaps even more horrific, and it, it is, it is uh, a subject for a later lecture, lecture but um, it was firebombing, firebombing, firebombing. Now, there's much debate as to how many people died during the firebombings. That's not what we want to get into now. What I want to tell you is that firebombing is this idea that you go and set a city on fire. And we all know fire. Fire creates its own weather system. The weather system is a low-pressure zone. Well, whenever there's a low-pressure zone, what happens? Air streams in from all directions. To, cor to correct the balance. And as the air streams in, it, it brings that oxygen-rich wind. And with that oxygen-rich oxygen wind, when it hits those flames, it's like flames from the sky. It is as if the entire city was a tinderbox and just leaps up into flame. If you've ever seen a forest fire, and if you've ever seen a tree, say a tall pine tree, 50 years old, and that pine tree, the fire approaches, the fire approaches, and that pine tree spontaneously combusts. Seemingly, the fire is far away, seemingly, as you watch it advance, but it just combusts due to heat and oxygen and maybe one tiny little spark. This is what it would be like to live inside of a firebombing. The United States firebombed Tokyo. And most famously, due to Slaughterhouse-Five, Kurt Vonnegut's famous, wonderful novel, Dresden. Dresden, Germany. I had some more graphic images in this presentation, but I, I removed them. Oh, the longer I live, and I'm just 25, you guys, gee. 
the longer I live, the more I uh, understand the need not to look at those things. Understand them. Embrace them. Take them into your heart and soul, as it were, because they should never be forgotten. But to ruminate, to ruminate, that's where the damage is done. So you see what I have here. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I think that image sums it up. I think that image sums it up. The stern idealism. The, uh, the vision of imminent glory in his eyes. And the matching expressions on the young German, perhaps Aryan faces behind him. It's horrifying to me. That image right there sums it all up to me. It's horrifying. Let's talk about it. Of course, you know, the Jews were systematically exterminated. The number I have is almost six million. Six million. Do you know that a million is a thousand thousand? Okay, okay, okay. Imagine if you had a hundred thousand dollars. That'd be pretty doggone good. Great. What if you had a what if you had a thousand thousand dollars? Hey man, now you're talking. What if you had six thousand thousand dollars? The biggest stadium in the city where I live, Austin, Texas, holds Roughly a hundred thousand people. Now think about six million Jews, and the horror begins to come to mind. Six million. How many people died? How many United States citizens died? Almost three hundred thousand. Is around three hundred thousand, hovering right out there. Three hundred thousand ten, if you will. Um, of those, 31,000 New York citizens died. We have many other statistics. I mean, we, you know, the United States bonded together, banded together. You see Rosie the Riveter. You see, you see all of these uh, stra scrap metal drives in the United States. And uh, it was a call to action. And we responded. And good for us. We helped the world rid itself of this tyrant. So postmodernism, postmodernism, after horror like that, how can you retract to where you were before to go lay by a bubbling brook and pontificate on the power and majesty of ducks as in William Bryant's To a Waterfowl you, you just can't do it writing poetry after Auschwitz is barbaric so where does that leave the artist hey man hey when you're an artist a writer a visual artist, a sculptor, a singer, a composer, whatever the case may be, when you wake into this world with a need to create, that's more powerful than anything. You don't do it because, because you want to. You do it because you have no choice. You have to. You are an artist. So even after the horror of the Second World War, even after the horror of Auschwitz, Six million, six million souls, human beings. It's too many for me. Too much to think of. Even after that, you don't stop being an artist. You don't stop being a creator. It's in your soul. And I think you'd rather die than not have it. So the question becomes, what do you do? What do you create? What new message do you set free into the world? What do you say after the Holocaust? You have studied post, you've studied modernism, 
and this fragmentation of society after the First World War, this loss of faith, this sense of disillusion. I want you to take all of that, the, the feelings that were felt by the uh, greatest generation, take all of that, not greatest generation, by the lost generation, the writers, writers and artists in Paris, take all of that and heighten it three, four, five levels. This sense of disillusion is deepened, exacerbated, pronounced. The feeling that an, an individual is alienated, pushed in a corner, put on a deserted island, alone, alone. Alone to struggle through the horrors and, and hardships of life in solitude, alienation. Postmodernism embraces these things, and then this idea that, that existence is meaningless. You gotta think, Second World War, how many sterling, how many of America's best, brightest, most wonderful people, how many John F. Kennedys died before they got a chance to be John F. Kennedy? How many of our best was standing on the wrong corner at the right time, or the wrong time as you see it, and was turned into a fine pink mist by a by a artillery shell. Hmm. Well, did the universe somehow smile and knock the shell away and say, oh, that's one of the good ones? Hmm. No. So it highlights this idea of meaninglessness. You think there's this great guiding hand. You think that there is this uh, guardian angel, this force that really keeps things in line. But something like the Second World War comes along and you realize there is no force. There is no hand. We are here on an ocean in a canoe. And the waves are lapping over the side and we're bailing the water out at every... We, as humans, cling to this idea of peace, safety, security. Maybe like before COVID-19, we were kind of just clipping along. Oh, it'll all be okay. It's going to be fine. Until it's not. We cling to this illusion that, that everything is okay. That we're in the lane. And if you're in the lane, you'll be all right. But we find out through postmodernism that there is a void beneath us. Our lives are perched upon that void. Move that hand. These structures that we depend on so deeply are castles made in the sand. And the wave action comes and no more castles. All the conventions of the world, even the modern conventions, which were turned upside down, at the very least, those are questioned. Writers and artists break free from those conventions. All order of all kind is rejected. And above all, postmodernism champions the absurd. What is the absurd? Well, it's that which lacks all structure, definition, meaning, purpose, reality. Uh, absurdity is the only thing these artists conceived possible as their artistic subjects after the Second World War. So let's, let's, uh, let us let us look at some postmodernism in art. And by that, I hope to illustrate to you postmodernism in literature. So let's start off with my personal friend, Tad Lorenzen Wright. Actually, I grew up with this dude. Uh, I grew up with him in, in San Angelo, Texas. Holla. The thriving metropolis of 80,000 people that it is. <laughs> I always say, you know, civilization had this path that it took throughout the world. 
If you look at where San Angelo is in West Texas, it's like the last place civilization came to. <laughs> it just so happens that's my hometown. Nonetheless, Tad Lorenzen Wright, he's my, he's my buddy from school. He is a postmodern artist. He's not, I mean, he's a real artist. He, he makes money at art. He's not just like, you know, he has some other job and he does art on the side. No, he, he makes money as art. This is one of his productions. And here it is. Is that art? And you got to ask yourself, what is art? That is the focus of this next part of this, this discussion. What is art? What is it? I don't know. I mean, if I was to just kind of go flash my hands, is that art? Well, I was expressing something. Is it your art? Oscar Wilde said, live, you live your life as if your life is your art. Well, so how large do you want the circle of possibilities to be for art? I'm going to challenge that today. I'm going to challenge it big time. Here we have Tad Lorenzen Wright, his, uh, his definition of the artist. First, a person who produces works of the arts that are primary, blah, blah. Okay, great. But let's skip down. A person who works in one of the performing arts as an actor, musician. Great, fine. A person whose work exhibits exceptional skill. Great. A person who is expert at trickery or deceit. Obsolete and artisan. What's he saying? He's, he's making a point here. He's making a point that art can be anything. Let's look at Tad's. Let's look at Tad's website. So Tad is famous for this. Uh, by the way, before I get too far into the art portion, here is the War by Ken Burns. Man, the Second World War. I can't think of too much that is more appropriate to study. We should study it. We should never forget it. Like I said with the images, don't ruminate on it, but we should embrace it. We should know it. We should keep it here so that it doesn't happen again. This documentary is the best I've seen. There's there's several parts to it. We're looking at like seven hours, but it's seven hours that'll be definitely worth it. Tad, Tad is known for his continuous line drawings. Okay, here's one. The idea with a continuous line drawing is you start with your pencil here, pen, whatever you're using, and you draw a figure without picking up your pen. Oh, wonderful. Now, you're done with this figure, you go to the next. Without picking up your pen now, don't pick it up. So you can see this art here. It's an expression for sure. It's different, for sure. He calls it beautiful costume party. Nice. Um, he's, he's well known for his collages like this. So all, this is the, United, the seal of the United States of America. All within here, he has various different uh, ancillary images. You can see the... And, and if you're, of course, if you're interested, please come to Tad's website. This is not a plug for Tad. I mean, he's just, he's a postmodern artist. Here we have the Mona Lisa. Um, and, and inside the Mona Lisa, you see some of his other pieces. Okay. Wonderful. So let's go back and let's look at some of the other art that I have assembled for you today. Uh, this is Brad Dedimer, uh, Brian Dedimer. These are dictionaries. Oh my gosh, dictionaries. They used to be, you know, look, 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 look. Before Wikipedia, before, there was a time. I mean, I'm only like 21, 22, something like that. So I don't know. I wasn't there. But um, there, I, hear, I hear there was a time when dictionaries were the go-to places for information. And if you needed to know something a little bit higher than a dictionary, you go to encyclopedias. Uh, the problem with encyclopedias is that most families, they would, they would have high hopes and they would subscribe to, to the encyclopedia and you would get a new volume, usually a new letter of the alphabet each month or each bi-monthly or whatever. And then the families would, uh, would subscribe and they'd get the first three, four, five, six volumes. 
and then they'd run out of money and quit. So <laughs> people would know a lot about aardvarks and and uh, and battle implements or whatever you want. But uh, once you get to like you know, T S Z, you're not gonna have it. That was a side note. But here we have one of the beautiful illustrated dictionaries from that time. And what this artist has done is cut into the dictionary with an exacto knife to find the images to reveal a new image from those images. Postmodern art, man. It's absurd, isn't it? But doesn't it convey that feeling? That feeling of senselessness? But what I always say is out of that senselessness, out of that absurdity, there emerges some sense of order. Yes, it is absurd. But from that absurdity, we find meaning. And that, I think, is the thrust of postmodernism. Let's move on. Here's another one. The image I have here is kind of, kind of uh, blurry. Here we go. Ah, a humument. A humument by Tom Phillips. Tom Phillips, uh, here's his website. So he had this idea. He said, I have to go. <laughs> it's just fun, so funny to me. He said, I have to go find the worst. <laughs> He's a British guy. I had to go find the worst Victorian novel possible. <laughs> and it has to be, I have to buy it for two pence. It's like two, like two pennies, you know. And so he, he looked all over England. He went to yard sales and whatnot. And he finally, he finally found it. He finally found it. And it is a horrible... Victorian novel, and, and you guys, you you can go, you can go right here to his website. It's all freely available for you right here. the The entire book is available on PDF right here. He he said, I bought this novel. It is it is a a horrible Victorian novel named A Human Document. So what he does is. This is the original page <laughs> of a human document. And what he does in the first version here, he paints, he's a painter, he paints over portions of the document. But he leaves portions out so that he reveals a new novel, a new novel a new novel from the novel that was written by the original author. His is called A Humument, and it is made from the human document. And it, his says, I sing a book of the art that was... I sing... The following I sing, a book, a book of art, of mind art, and that which he hid, reveal I. So he has two, docu he has two versions here. Nonetheless, you can go back and look through this. It is a, it is a striking example of postmodernism. You have the first version here, and it even has a villain. Toge. Toge is the villain. And it, he, he writes this entire document, he writes this entire novel by just revealing portions of a previous author's document, uh, novel. And I think, it, it, among other things, it's hilarious. So you can see this thing here. Now this right here, this is high postmodernism. Can you see the absurdity of it? Can you see that it, it champions absurdity? What I love about a humument is that it, it, it combines both art and literature. So what better example could we, could we glean? What better example could we find of postmodernism than this beautiful 
human, hum, human, human document. Look at the, the center of this page, moral. Look at all the morals, moral, 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 moral. If you know about the Victorian era, yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I get a give. I get a big kick out of a humument. He even shows up in his own work with a self-portrait. <laughs> nice. Okay. A humument. I have some selected pages here. Here's Toge. The names she named were present. Toge. It was Miss Wilkinson's other eye, and the music changed. You, seventy famous eyes looking at a poet, and the metamorphosis of the poet. When did the change begin? <laughs> you should read it. If you think this is interesting at all, you should read it. It is a certainly a, a quest in postmodernism. Here's his original self, uh, his uh, original self-portrait. Now let's talk about Palm Sontag. This is another example of postmodern. Now you go to a museum, you go to a museum, and you're interested, you, you see, hey, I'm going to see some pay. You don't think about walking into a room and there's a big dead palm tree there. <laughs> a big dead palm tree right there with these kind of uh, sh shadows or representations of some kind of art back here. All of them involving palm trees and some some stage of death, I assume. I don't know. But that's kind of the point of postmodernism. Is like, what does that mean? I have previously spoken about the circle of of meaning. Anything, you know. I say, I have a I have a poem that says this poem means Tuesdays are wonderful. That's the whole poem. Well, the circle of meaning is very low. Someone, it's going to be hard for someone to come and say, no, it actually means la mermaids fighting with laser swords on Friday is good. Nah, it, it, it doesn't mean that. <laughs> you know, so, okay. It just depends on however narrow you want the circle of meanings to be. Because anytime you get inside here, it's acceptable, you know. A, sh a poem that short could mean a lot of things. Or it couldn't mean as many things as something like this. Now, this is modernism. You're going to have to forgive me. But in a station of a metro, the apparition of these faces in the crowd pedals on a wet black bow. What? Okay, all right. This would be a time to talk about imagism of the modern era, but but nonetheless, in postmodern art and literature, the, the, the circle of meanings gets larger and larger and larger until it is really a reader response type of type of endeavor. You really look at it and you, you say, well, what do you think it means? Oh, what do you think it means? <laughs> and so everybody has a little bit slight, slightly different meaning. So then what happens is you end up with this idea that the art is your meaning. The art. The art of it is not the art of it. The art is your meaning. Wow. Well, that, that is something. That is something. And then you get into the humorous side of it. Oh, you guys, this right here, this is uh, Komar and Melamed. And they are some of the most preeminent postmodern artists. And they scoured the globe to find any unknown artists. And they found one. His name is Nikolai Bukomov. Nikolai Bukomov, he's a Russian. And this is him. You know, he has the eye patch. 
And uh, I just want to know what product you have to put in your mustache to, you know, like, get it up like that. Nicola Bukomov. <laughs> Why is it that you always have to look disgusted when you say any deeply Russian Nikola Bukomov? <laughs> Forget about it. Anyway, they discovered this artist, Nikola Bukomov. He has one eye and all that. And he had some amazing stuff. They just pulled it out of the archives. And here is his most famous painting. So look, the two of them here. He has uh, this one. And then there's their landscape. That, that, wait, but what is this? It's his nose. His nose is in there. Oh, God. They were joking with us the whole time. Nikola Bukumov was a joke. He didn't exist. This, he has an eye patch, you know, and so his, no <laughs> his nose shows up in the painting. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, I'm moving on. All right, these are Komar and Melnamid. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about the people's choice. And the people's choice is... For lack of a better word, crowd-sourced art. Crowd-sourced art. So, the most wanted song and the most unwanted song. Komar and Melnum had decided to present a survey to the people of this world. Present a survey in which they decided uh, what types of music do you like the best? You've heard people forever saying, uh, I, I listen to everything. Do you really? Do you really? So they, they, they presented this survey. And it, from that survey, people responded to what they most like to see in musical pieces. And from that survey, they contracted with uh, Dave Soldier, and uh, to, to create that music. And so from that, they created the world's most wanted music. <laughs> and we have to watch a video. The most wanted music. So it's said to be Celine Dion, Celine Dion esque. Um, it has guitar, bass, piano, drums. It builds to, to a crescendo. There's a chorus. It's catchy. It has that hook. A woman singing, beautiful voice. And everything, even up to the content of the songs, comes from the surveys. <laughs> but what's even more interesting than that, even more interesting than that, is the most unwanted song. <laughs> the most unwanted song. And this is said to have... Let me start it here. We'll probably have to the watch the most it. unwanted music. Sorry. <laughs> it's said to have the poll reveals 
that uh, people would least like to hear accordions, <laughs> cowboy music, bagpipes, opera, rap music, children's voices, tubas, drum machines, and advertising jingles. <laughs> and so, even down to the content, they really chose everything in this song to be the least wanted music on the planet. Let's listen a moment. Alright, so the other the most wanted song was two or three minutes long. This one 21 minutes and 58 seconds. Well, let's get comfortable. No. Let me just fast forward a little bit <laughs> and see where we end up. So you have an opera singer singing. <laughs> uh, you Later on, you have an opera singer doing rap. Mm. Children's voices. Walmart! <laughs> and here you have the jazz fingers. Okay. So, you're, you, we have come to the level of saying, is that art? Well, oh, and the funniest thing ever is from doing these lectures over the years, from time to time I'll be running. <laughs> I'll be out running and this thing will creep its way into my playlist when I'm running. <laughs> I'll be just, you know, I'll be in the moment and it'll be at Walmart. Oh, you know, it'll come on. Oh my gosh. Oh, wow. Okay. It's not very good music. But is it postmodern? Absolutely. It champions the absurd. It champions this idea that everything is fragmented and there is really no meaning. The only meaning is your response to the art. Okay, moving on. Ladies, 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 your man's an artist. He's an artist. He, it's in his soul. And he comes to you and he says, uh, I, I, I created this, these beautiful floors. It's so good. And, and you say, oh, let me, let me see them. He says, they're marble. Oh, yeah. You go and look <laughs> Look in there, and this is what you see. Uh, they're made of lunch meat. Yeah, yeah, marbled lunch meat. Like you know, it, you can kind of tell this is the this is the uh, bologna ish. This is the turkey ish. This is the ham, all marbled, nice with fat and. Oh my God. This is whip. This is my personal favorite. Whim de la voix. And uh, this is his marble floors made of lunch meat. What do you think it smells like in there? All right. Ladies, ladies. Your man's an artist. Your man is an artiste. This is him right here. <laughs> That's Wim Delavoie. And you know what he does? He tattoos pigs. Yeah, he tattoos pigs. That's what that's his art. That's, you know. Yeah, he tattoos. He, he <laughs> There I've got this new work of art for you, baby. Can you come look at it? And the <laughs> I can't even go on. Okay. So, <clears throat> this is one of his works right here. Mm. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I don't know. What is is that? Mickey Mouse crucified tattooed on a dead pig <laughs> Wim Wim had to move to China uh cuz animal rights you know we're serious about that here uh this dude's like man I'm getting paid I don't know So here we have uh th this is Louis So, so this, this is all Wim de la Voix. 
this is uh, this is called a mosaic and uh it looks kind of pretty to me you know it might be like tile somewhere i don't know but wait you look a little that's poop mm, that's poop oh yeah that's poop <laughs> okay moving on uh this right here <clears throat> This is called Anal Kisses, and you can uh, <clears throat> And the worst part is it's on Hotel Stationery. <laughs> okay, okay, but my question, is that art? Is that art? Well, okay, now we're pushing the boundaries, aren't we? This is postmodernism, and I can't... Let's move it from this anal kiss thing. I don't know. It's just like a little bit. So, here we have the Grand Poobah. This is the coup de grace. This is the ultimate expression of postmodern art. Ladies. <laughs> Your man's an artist. Oh, baby, I've got this new, like, I'm, I just need you to see it. It's just like it was, it came from the deepest part of my spirit. And, uh, and I just, I hope you'll love it. It's just so important to me and you get there and it's this contraption it's this machine it's this machine and you say you say whim my man i've been with you up i, I was with you through the pigs and the, and the butt kisses and and whatever else you but this well i don't i don't really and he says oh no no listen listen uh so the the finest restaurants in New York, they and and Stockholm, and, and they bring their their best dishes to me, and they put these dishes in the receptacle here, and 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 my machine, it processes the dish, and I feed it through the tubes, and I feed it through this through a many stage process, just like your digestion tract. Oh, you can see where this is going. And and in the end, it produces an outcome. This is the outcome. <laughs> so is I mean it's it's a I mean let's just say it, it's a poop machine. It, it, you know, it's a poop it's a poop machine. So <laughs> So this is that art? Is that art? Isn't it? Is it an expression of personal? Yeah, but I don't know. So this is how far cloaca is the kind of the pinnacle of how far art has come in the in the, in the postmodern age. And uh, you know, so you can't really make you know how are you going to sell a cloaca machine? You know, only like two or three museums in the world are going to buy it. So. Uh, Wim decided, he said, okay, de la voix. He decided, I'll sell the outcome. And here's the outcome. With a Coca-Cola symbol, cloaca. Okay, okay. So, of course, the New York Health Department shut him down quickly, but, uh, uh, to my knowledge, anyway. Um, so this, I, I went through all of this to to challenge you as to your impression of what art can and cannot be. But under postmodernism, the circle of meanings is large. And to finish it all off, let's discuss postmodern music. Postmodern music follows the same theme, the same aesthetic. And uh, it's not something <laughs> that you're accustomed to. So let's start off with any with Charles Dodge, one of the great postmodern musicians. And let's start off with any resemblance is purely coincidental.
man sitting in the cafeteria. Sitting in the cafeteria. Sitting in the cafeteria. I mean, and one enormous ear. Can and you, one tiny one. Can you dance to it? Which one state? Which one state? Later, 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 later. The nights will catch. I've done better than this. One, just one, one, playing one, around one, on a new nine. app on my phone. Okay, we're moving on. Moving on. How about uh, the next Charles Dodge? Here about how about he destroyed her image? Let's try that one. <laughs> Destroy. 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 I can see Beavis and Butthead rocking out to that. Okay, so we're going to do uh, John Zorn, You Will Be Shot. You Will Be Shot. Sounds like well, at, at times there it sounded a lot like the world's most unwanted music. <laughs> All right, how about Anthony Braxton? You ready for this? This is when I was learning to play the saxophone. It's like that first day. It's hard to dance to. It just is. Okay. Moving on. Let's do. Let's do. Uh, <clears throat> all right. One of the great challenges. Oh, we're gonna watch you. Is knowing enough about the subject. Neil deGrasse Tyson. You're right. This is pretty. I think this is actually kind of cool. everything though doesn't it postmodernism it challenges all that is art and on that note i would like to introduce you to a personal friend of mine not really john cage
is it art? Yeah. But I guess the question really is, is it good art? I mean, it's not on your playlist. You know it's not on your playlist. Okay, now and now. I'm going to show you Dance by John Cage. You have these... You know, these are like Broadway, I mean, these are fabulous dancers. These are like New York's finest. And this is, okay, here's what I want you to do. <laughs> here's what I want you to do. Go, just make your arms just get all crazy. Like, they're like, man, whatever, we're getting paid. <laughs> do the robot. Hey, do the robot, do the robot, do the robot, do the robot. Yeah, man. Hey, hey, hey. Do the moon. Oh, good grief. We're going to stop it there. All right. So we're moving on. So anyway, now. Now, what I would like for you to do is uh, have a moment with me, okay? So, so like, uh, this next one, 433, is very important. It's very, very, very important. Profound, if you will. And uh, I'm going to show it to you now. And it is from Mr. John Cage. We got to get tuned up here. Wait for us to get tuned up. All right. We're just going to get tuned up. We're going to get tuned up. And uh, as soon as we do, it's going to be fine. You know, we're going to get tuned up. So here we go, ready? Yeah, we're good, we're getting tuned up now. <laughs> now this is serious this is real serious okay we're ready Here we go with the next the next section. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. All right, all right, all right. So so check it out. The whole point of that is that music is sound and silence and composing is developing a harmony between the two. So John Cage came through and he said, "I am going to create and he literally did this. He, he, he's, a, he's a very famous pianist. So he went out onto stage and he sat down. He said, I have created the greatest compose, uh, composition ever. And he sat down at the piano and flipped his tux tails back. And he sat down and he put his fingers on the keys and just stopped. And he was silent and four... 3-3 three, three is 4 minutes and 33 seconds of silence. He would say, and I mean, just like I did, I mean, at some, point in the, at some point in him just sitting there, there was all this noise and things going on in the, and at some point somebody went, <coughs> you know, and started laughing. And so, I mean, but what he would say is he would say, I didn't provide the sound for this the audience did that was the music and so today i think i have 
I hope I have illustrated postmodernism and how crazy it is and how delicious, you know? I mean, truly, after something like the Second World War, maybe after COVID-19, maybe we are in a new territory, you know? So how do you create art? How do you make meaning in that post atrocity, post death, post holocaust, post horror, post insanity world? Postmodernism is that is that uh, response. <laughs>